All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your next online class here with Delphian. I'm James, and today we're going to be talking some more about space science. So I came prepared with my helmet here. Not a bad helmet. Well, uh, as promised on uh, during our class on Tuesday, we're going to be talking about the search for alien planets today. And it's easy to say alien planets, but that's not the right word for it. It's not technically correct. It's not wrong. We're going to learn the better word for it. So I'm saying the search for alien planets, but so alien means coming from a planet other than our own or coming from a star other than our own. So yes, technically that is correct. But what I meant is an exoplanet, which is specifically a planet that orbits a star other than our own. And planet, obviously, big ball of rock or gas orbiting a star. We all are familiar with the concept of a planet. Exo just means external or from the outside. So exoplanet sounds really you know, scientific and complicated. And it just means planet from not around here, not in our neighborhood. So welcome to the search for exoplanets. But if I put exoplanets in the title, then people not, might not know what that means right away. All right, Ian's asking, oh, Ian, yes, I didn't get to this question. I saw this question after you signed off last time. He says, is, uh, a blue moon isn't a blue moon. It is really the second full moon in a month. That's correct. And I don't know why they call it a blue moon. There's probably a really good reason for it that I am not aware of. All right, well, hello to everyone that is signing in and saying hello. Um, I've got something a little bit special for you. So we covered this subject uh, three, four months ago, back when we were doing our spring classes. But I have bonus material that I brought with me today. So I'm gonna try to wrap up these slides around 11.45 as scheduled. Um, if you've attended any of my classes here, you know that the chances of that happening are not Great, I usually go over time. Um, after that, I'm gonna stick around for another 15, 20 minutes and I have more. What did I bring? Well, I guess you'll just have to stick around to find out. Okay, so when we're trying to learn about something new, it's useful to compare it to something that you already know about. So before we go looking for other planets around other star systems, we need to look at our own star system and our own, the, the planets in our neighborhood, which is are the easiest ones for us to, to observe and get information about. So here's a rough sketch of our solar system, not to scale. Uh, well, it's to scale. The, the sizes of the planets here are correct relative to each other. Obviously, they're much farther away from each other than that. So we've got a big old sun in the middle. We've got little Mercury, medium-sized Venus, Earth, Mars, giant Jupiter, Saturn, and kind of mid-sized gas planets of Uranus and Neptune. Um, not including Pluto here, we talked about that. Uh, that's just a fight we're not gonna get into today. Uh, looking down at our solar system from kind of above is you see the sun there in the middle. There's Mercury orbiting closest to the sun and Mercury's orbit's not perfect. It's a little weird, it's kind of off to the side. It gets pretty close to the sun and then a little bit farther away, it kind of wobbles. But that's top down looking there. And if we zoom out a little bit more, again, looking kind of from the top down, that inner white ring, those are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And then you see those yellow rings showing the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. If I'm going a little fast on that, it's because this isn't the main thing we're trying to cover today. And if you didn't catch or was I talking about the planets of our solar system last week? Yeah, I think so. Head to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the Delphian School, I think is the link. And um, the full class on that, we, we talk about our solar system for a good 45 minutes or more because I'm terrible at staying within time limits. So that's a general picture of our own solar system. We can use that as our uh, kind of comparison going forward. So if we're going to look for other planets, if we're going to observe other planets, other star systems, how do you even go about doing that? How do you even start? And before I answer that question that I just asked, I'm going to check in the comment section. Okay, good. So Gerard's asking, what are aliens? Well, different definitions for that. 
Uh, the one I'm going to be using here, alien, again, coming from somewhere outside, somewhere from other, somewhere from a planet, a planet other than our own, or coming from a star other than our own. So if we were to find life on Mars, we would definitely say that is alien life because it's not our own planet. Um, there was an asteroid that came, a big asteroid that came zooming through our solar system sometime last year. And they could tell from its speed and its direction that it was not from our solar system. It was an alien asteroid coming through um, our solar system. We knew it was not from around here. It came from another star. It's pretty cool. So when I say alien, that's what I'm talking about. Um, okay. And Aubrey is asking, what is an astronaut's favorite drink? I... I'm going to have to let you answer that one, Aubrey. I think that you're smarter than me when it comes to these jokes. All right, as we wait for Aubrey's revelation here, uh, I'm gonna keep going here. So obviously the first way that you could look for a planet is to pop behind a telescope and look out there. And hey, that's a good way of doing it. You can def definitely find planets that way, but there's a problem with finding planets is that um, they're small and dark and stars are big and bright. And if you're trying to look, if someone, if there's a big giant light in a room and there is a speck of dust in front of that light, it's gonna be really hard for you to see that speck of dust because the light's just way bigger and way brighter. And you're gonna look at it, the star, this, the light, and you're gonna go, oh man, it's so bright, I can't see. All right, Aubrey says that an astronaut's favorite drink is a root beer float. Get it? Because astronauts are in zero gravity, they're floating. I like that. All right, I hope you're all as entertained with that as I am. So you can get a bigger telescope, right? Bigger telescope, you can see more stuff. Here's a huge telescope. There's this, I mean, this guy's standing right in front of it. That's a big, big telescope. You can see a lot more with it. Um, there's even bigger telescopes than that. So for comparison, here's the Statue of Liberty, which is the standard unit of measurement of everything in America. Um, this thing here, this is Photoshopped. All these things are put together. And this thing here is called the um, Very Large Telescope. They, they really wanted a very scientific and exotic sounding name for that, so they called it the Very Large Telescope because it is a telescope that is very large. Cool. Uh, and then, you know, there's, they're planning on building this thing, which I think, if, if I'm recalling correctly, is called the Extremely Large Telescope. I think they're getting, well, I don't know, this seems like lazy naming. I, uh, you could probably call it the Pokeball Telescope because it looks like a Pokeball to me. I'm sure you could think, come up with a better name than the Extremely Large Telescope, but credit to them is, you know, uh, they're not wrong. That is an extremely large telescope. But again, stars are really bright. So here's one way to look for planets. There's, I think, five ways. We're gonna talk about four of them today because one of them is really weird. But so one way to look for planets is to cover up the stars so it's not shining in your eyes. If you're looking, you know, there's a, there's a light in the room and there's a fly buzzing around, you're trying to see the fly, you, you put your hand up to block the light and then you can see the fly buzzing around or you can see the whatever it is that you're looking for next to it. Like these guys here. Um, he, hey, he's, he took it one step further. He has sunglasses and he's holding his hand up. He's gonna get some really good observations. Um, they're looking at the sun. Please don't do that. I don't know why I put this picture in here. That's a terrible way to look at the sun. You could damage your eyes. Don't do that. All right, good. So here is, let's say you take uh, something and you use it to block out the sun. You can see what's around the sun even better. This is uh, a picture of a solar eclipse where the moon is blocking the sun perfectly for us, perfectly. And you can see areas around the sun that you never get to see because the sun's always brighter than it. So you block out the brightest bits, you can see the bits that aren't so bright. Uh, so that is called direct imaging. You block the star and you can see the planet directly. I look, I see the camera, direct imaging. Very simple, 
concept, but there's a lot of problems with it. So they started coming up with other ideas. Hey, if you can't see a thing directly, you can figure out some stuff about it indirectly. So you can look at the wobble of the star. Um, if you were to hold on to your dad and have your dad spin you around, you're gonna be like spinning around in a big circle. I think we've probably all done this. Um, but your dad is also gonna be spinning in a circle, not as big as you, he's gonna be spinning in a smaller circle like this. So even if you can't see the planet and you can't see the planet spinning around, you'll still be able to see the star wobbling as the planet spins around it. Planets have gravity. They're just really small compared to stars. So the star isn't gonna be pulled greatly one way or the other, but we can still kind of see that star wobble. So here's big movement on the outside of, from the planet, which is causing, it's, they're kind of happening. It's not even that it's causing, they're happening together at the same time. One is causing the other, this little wobble of, the star on the inside. All right, method number three is to compare a star to other stars. Um, let's see, did I give some slides on that? No, cool. So star wobble is, you look at the star and the star is moving and you do calculations, it takes a lot of math and you can say, well, we know that the star is this big. We know that the star is this massive, it has this much gravity. So we know that in order for it to wobble in the way that we're observing, um, that the planet that's orbiting it has to be this massive. It has to be the size of Jupiter or the size of Earth or something like that. So you can figure out quite a bit. Um, so you can look at that one star. You can also compare that one star to other stars around it in the sky. And you can see all these stars are here and this star kind of moves relative to that one and moves relative to that one. It's just another way of seeing the wobble of the star. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because we're gonna talk mostly about the fifth one. The fourth, the, the, the fourth one's really complicated. I'm not gonna go over it, um, but it's really cool. Here is how we have found most exoplanets, is that the planet passes directly in front of the star relative to where we're looking at it. Before I go into that, I realize I have been completely ignoring your comments in Q&A section. Uh, okay, good. All right, Brando says, is there anything bigger than extremely large? All right, so let us together brainstorm some ideas for the next large telescope. So we've got the very large telescope, we've got the extremely large telescope, which they're planning to build. What would you call the next big one? What's a good word for even bigger than extremely large? Um, super massive. Okay, I like that. The super massive telescope. That sounds really cool. Uh, the humongous telescope. The massively large telescope. The mega telescope. All right, Howard. I love it. Um, good. You guys should work for NASA. Be like, hey, hey, got a better idea for the name of this telescope. All right, or you could just call it the James Telescope. Cool. All right, uh, Evan gave a comment here um, asking if Pluto's an exoplanet. Pluto is not an exoplanet. The definition of an exoplanet is specifically a planet that is not orbiting our sun. It's a planet orbiting a different star out there. So Pluto, it's still orbiting our sun. It's still within our neighborhood here. It's relatively close. Uh, a couple last names for telescope submissions before we move on. Ian has the Ultra Telescope. I like that, or the Ultrascope for short. Mackenzie and Denali, welcome back, you guys. And with your amazing name submission, the Super Hugely Large Telescope. I might have to go with that. All right. So let's learn more about this planet passing in front of a star. Um, when a planet passes in front of a star, when one thing passes in front of anything else, this is called transit, passing through or across a place. So here is an actual picture of Venus, right there is that spot in the, in, up in the upper corner of the sun. There's Venus transiting our own sun. 
from our point of view. Uh, here is a picture of Mercury transiting the sun. It's much smaller than Venus, uh, but still here on Earth, if we didn't already know that Mercury existed and we were looking at the sun like this with a safe set of equipment, and we saw this shadow, this dot pass in front of it, we would know, hey, there's a, there's a planet there. So huge telescopes on Earth are a good way to look at space, but it's even better to look with a telescope in space. This avoids all this uh, stuff in the atmosphere. There's air, there's dust, there's all kinds of stuff happening. You go out into space, it's a much cleaner, clearer picture. This beauty right here, the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990, and it has given us some of the most incredible science in the history of humanity. Um, it started looking not specifically for exoplanets, look at all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, but after a while, they started, scientists started using the data from Hubble and doing some specific, like, hey, could you please look here, Hubble, so that we can see what's there. So in 1992, the first two exoplanets were officially discovered. Um, scientists got data from the telescopes, did their math, published their conclusions. All the other scientists said, yep, that checks out. We like that. It was two uh, planets orbiting a neutron star, which we learned about the other day. So that's pretty cool. Uh, definitely no life on those planets. There's so much intense radiation from that neutron star that anything that tried to grow on those planets would be fried to a crisp. But hey, they were the first ones we found. Uh, in 1999, we had the first exoplanet transit seen. So now this is a picture of our own sun with Venus transiting our own sun, but we saw something like this in another planet passing in front of another star out there in the universe. That was a very exciting day for science. They knew it was possible. They knew they were gonna see this a lot, but 1999 was the first time that it actually happened. So here is a chart showing how many exoplanets have been discovered every year and the method of their discovery. Um, the purple bar there is showing how many exoplanets were discovered through that transit method. Um, let's see, did I leave the key down there of what the rest of these mean? I don't think so. I forget what green is. Green might have been, um, I think green was star wobble, seeing the wobble back and forth. Uh, but purple, as you can see, that transit method where planet passes between us and that star is the most reliable way currently to verify the existence of a planet. And they can learn a lot about that planet just from this little bit of data that they're able to get from just the planet passing in front of it. And I'm going to go back really quick. So when scientists are looking for a planet transiting in front of its star, we're actually not looking at with a picture like this. This is what it looks like in our own solar system. We can get away with it in our own solar system, but the other stars are too far away for us to see it like this. All they're doing is they're watching the star and they watch the star for many years. And they look for the light of that star to dim. So let's say the light is shining from that star at 100%. It is as bright as we see it, and that's how bright the star is. And then they notice that the star dips to 99.993% as bright as it was before for like an hour, and then it goes back up, and the brightness goes back up to 100%. I'm not sure if those numbers are correct, but that's kind of the neighborhood of what they're looking for in the dimming of a star. It's a fraction of a percent. Uh, if you look at how small this planet is compared to our star, we would still be able to see our, you know, we're getting this much energy from our sun and then the energy goes down, bloop, just the tiniest bit and then bloop, back up. I don't even know if you could see my hand move there. But that's how sensitive some of these space telescopes are. They're able to see this stuff. So they have discovered thousands of exoplanets. You can see there was a few, here's 1992, 
And a couple years later, 1995, 96, 98, it started going up and up and up. 2010, 2011, 2014 was a great year for exoplanet discovery. 2016 blew that out of the water. In 2016 alone, they discovered almost 1,500 exoplanets in a single year. All right. What's next in my thing? Right, 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 right. <laughs> I was just putting all these slides together just a few minutes ago, and I forget what's next. It's a constant pleasant surprise for me. I'm like, oh, what's next? What am I going to learn from this very information that I put together for all of you? Um, so like I said, you are able to learn a lot about these planets just from this little flicker of light as it passes in front of its star. Because we know what stars look like. Uh, we know what each one is supposed to look like, how the light is supposed to act when it comes to us. We're going to learn a new word here. Don't worry about this one. We're going to learn all about it. Spectroscopy, which is a fancy word for looking at the light from other planets to see what's in their atmosphere. That's it. Looking at the light from other planets to see what they have in their atmosphere. We know that the sun, our own sun, gives off a certain kind of light. The light from our sun comes from a certain wavelength. It comes on a certain wavelength. It looks exactly a certain way. And when that light passes through our own atmosphere, our atmosphere absorbs certain parts of that light and lets other parts of that light through. And from that change in the light, you know, the, the, the sun looks more yellow to us here on Earth than it actually is in space because our atmosphere is absorbing other parts of the light, but it lets the yellow through quite well. So it looks more yellow to us. From that, they can tell what's exactly in the atmosphere because certain things, yeah, we'll get into that in a second. So you have a beam of light. I hope that we've all done some experiments with prisms. You send some white light through a prism and it breaks that light out into its various wavelengths. You've got your red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Well, certain elements like to absorb certain wavelengths of light. Hydrogen down here likes to absorb that exact color of red. Not this color of red, not that color of red kind of orange, you know, that color of red, that wavelength of light. Hydrogen just eats it up, it absorbs it, does not let it through. Um, sodium likes to absorb that color and that color right there. And calcium likes to absorb these two colors right here. So if you were to take, um, you know, a hydrogen gas, and you were to shine a white light through that hydrogen gas, all that light would come through the hydrogen gas except for that one little wavelength right there. And you're not going to, with the human eye, see that difference. But you know, we have instruments and computers and stuff that can see that and figure out exactly like, hey, hey, we, we, we've got a missing wavelength. You know, that color of red is not there. So we know that there's hydrogen. So that's really cool. Um, so you could kind of say that spectroscopy is studying the rainbows of other planets. That sounds pretty cool to me. What do you do? I, uh, I study alien rainbows. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. So we can learn a lot about these other planets. So not only do we get to learn that there's a planet that passes in front of this star and that it it, you know, we know how long its year is around that star, but we could also tell if that planet has any kind of atmosphere, we can tell what is in the atmosphere. So they know that there's planets out there that are about the size of Earth, that have oxygen in the atmosphere, that have nitrogen in the atmosphere, um, that has, you know, oxygen in the atmosphere, water. It's so cool. It, it's, it's really amazing. Um, so right now from what they're able to observe, it looks like every planet in our galaxy has at least one planet orbiting it. And about one in five of those stars 
have planets at the right distance from that sun to have liquid water. And it's estimated there's about one trillion planets in our galaxy alone. So liquid water is really important. We all need it to survive. If you don't drink water for three days, you die. Life as we know it requires liquid water. It may not be that life on other planets or life around other stars would require liquid water. But so far here on Earth, it's 100% of life needs liquid water. So that's what we're looking for. Um, we're really interested in those planets with liquid water. Let's take a look at some exoplanets that we found. Um, before we do that, popping into the Q&A section, I hope I'm not leaving all you guys in the dust. Um, all right, Gerard saying, was spectroscopy derived from the word spectrum? Yes, a spectrum is a, is a range of things, right? The spectrum of your voice, you can go low to high. There's a spectrum of notes in your voice, right? So you have the spectrum, you have the light spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. There we go. So yes, Gerard, very well done. Um, Aubrey says, ah, big word. <laughs> um, and I think I said planets orbiting planets a couple minutes ago. Alette pointed that out to me. Uh, that, was, that was misspoken. Planets orbiting stars. So thank you. Um, all right. Katya says, just because a planet doesn't have oxygen or water doesn't mean there's a species that requires a different type of water and, or, that, or an atmosphere that has oxygen. Totally correct. Totally correct. So scientists are looking for what they call life as we know it. Life as we know it does require liquid water. Most of it requires oxygen, right? There's certain things that we know, even bacteria and viruses need to live. Um, so that's where we're narrowing our search. There could absolutely, absolutely be life that we don't know about, that we can't conceive of yet that lives in the vacuum of space or, you know, like on a uh, comet out way, you know, only billions of miles from the sun out in the super cold dark of space. There could totally be stuff, but until we know what we're looking for in that, it's kind of hard to find it. Um, you know, if someone sends you to the store and they say, get me food I like, and you have no idea what food they like, your chance of just walking up to one thing in the store and being like, they're definitely definitely gonna like this salsa. Uh, the chances of you being correct on that are pretty small because you have no idea what they like. You bring it home, like I don't like spicy food or tomatoes, so I don't like salsa. But if they send you to the store and they're like, I like water, I like drinking liquid water, please go to the store and find something that I will like. You go to the store, you find liquid water, hey, they're gonna be like, you know what? This is something that I will consume. Thank you for procuring this for me. It just narrows down the search. All right, so whoop, let's stick back here. All right, we're gonna talk about the TRAPPIST-1 system first. Uh, system being a star being orbited by planets or other things, we have our solar system. We have the TRAPPIST-1 system. So when we say system, it's like one uh, collection, one group of things that operate together as a whole. Um, so here is our solar system on the bottom here. And if you were to kind of like zoom in, right? That's what this middle part here is. If you were to zoom in and enlarge that by 25 times, you'd be looking at something around this here. And up on top, it's showing Jupiter. That's the size of Jupiter and its moons, Io and Europa and Ganymede and Callisto, so that you can compare how big the TRAPPIST-1 system is. The TRAPPIST-1 system is very small compared to our own. All of its planets fit easily within the orbit of Mercury, the closest planet of our own star. And they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven planets around TRAPPIST-1 that they know are there. And this is a fascinating system here because not only are many of these planets roughly the size of Earth, look at this, here's Earth and planets D and E 
but D is a little bit smaller. E is right about the same size as Earth. F and G are a little bit larger than Earth, right? Um, not only that, let's see if I, yeah, I did here. So again, we're looking at how far away are they from their planet and could there be liquid water? So these first two planets, planets B and C, are too close. You see they're in this red zone here. And any water on that planet would boil away. It would not be able to stay liquid. It's too close, too hot. Um, D is kind of right on that edge there. It could be too hot. It could be the right temperature. It's right in the middle. But hey, E, F, and G are all within that green zone, the habitable zone that uh, we could habitate, we could live on those planets because it's the right temperature for liquid water. H, not so much. It's too far out there. You see it's, um, it's, on, it out, it's out in the cold edge. Here's what our habitable zone for our own solar system looks like. Mercury, way too close, way too hot. You see it's all red there. Venus is right on the edge. You know, if Venus didn't have such a thick atmosphere, it might be a better spot for us to go. But, so it's right on the edge, right? Earth, mm, mwah, perfect, perfect position. You could pick a better spot for our planet. And Mars, again, is just within our habitable zone. Starting to get a bit cold, but if Mars had a thicker atmosphere, be pretty comfortable there, be pretty comfortable there. Uh, so here is, the Kepler 40, oh, I actually you know what? I'm going too fast. I'm going to rewind. Why is it called the TRAPPIST-1 system? Uh, the telescope that found this system was the TRAPPIST telescope, which is a ground-based telescope in, I forget where on Earth. I do not remember that. I knew it. But it's here on Earth. It's called the TRAPPIST telescopes, and this is the first uh, planetary system that the TRAPPIST telescope Discovered, so TRAPPIST-1, good. Uh, Mackenzie and Ali, are there any planets that we could live on that we know about? All right. And Milo says you just got here. Hey, Milo, welcome back. Um, I know that you were in this class that I taught a couple of months ago, so I um, just jump in, follow along. We're talking about the search for exoplanets, alien planets. Um, so, Kenzie and Denal are asking, any planets that we could live in, live on? Yep. TRAPPIST-1, E, F, and G are all planets that we might be able to live on. Obviously, we don't know until we get there, but um, E is might be kind of hot. F looks like it's in the right spot. G, maybe a little bit cold. Also, G is bigger than Earth, so the gravity is going to be heavier. Um, so it might be a little bit uncomfortable, but hey, once you get used to it, yeah, could be totally fine. Here is the Kepler 47 system. Kepler because uh, there's a space telescope called the Kepler Space Telescope, and uh, it discovered a ton of planets. This was the 47th planetary system that it discovered, so Kepler 47. Um, here on the bottom for size comparison is our own solar system, and you can see the green band around it is showing where could you have planets that would be at the right distance to have liquid water? Um, so here's the Kepler 47, Kepler 47 system. Uh, it's fascinating that its habitable zone is not that much different from ours in terms of how far away from the star is habitable. But when I was growing up and when I was doing science class and learning about our solar system, it was very obvious, it was very clear, like, hey, small rocky planets uh, are closer to their stars and the big gas planets are farther away from stars. It was, the, I, it was my understanding that you couldn't have a big gas giant planet close to its star because it was too hot and the gas would burn away and it would, we don't have it in our solar system, so how could it exist? Well, Kepler-47 taught us otherwise. Kepler-47 was like, not so fast, my friend. Here is a gas giant way, you know, this is about the size of Neptune or Uranus, it looks like. And it's orbiting a little bit closer to its star than Mercury is to ours. 
completely changes the game. So you're telling me now that gas giants can be close to stars as well as far away? That changes things. That really opens up a lot of stuff. Kepler 47C is even bigger and it's orbiting at kind of a similar distance to its star that Earth is from our sun. That thing is massive. I didn't think that was possible. A lot of scientists didn't expect that and they were proven wrong. And a good scientist loves to be proven wrong because it means that there's more to learn, more to explore. All right, cool, I got it wrong. I'm gonna figure out how to do it right. I'm gonna adjust my equations. I'm gonna adjust my knowledge with all this new stuff. Uh, so we could not live on those planets. Those are gas giants. Um, there's no solid land for us to live on. But if there was a moon around one of those planets, which is very likely, we could live on one of those moons. Uh, Star Wars, episode six, they're on the forest moon of Endor. Endor is not a planet. Endor is a moon orbiting a gas giant. So that could work. Here's the Kepler-62 system. And again, our own planet, uh, our own solar system on the bottom for comparison. So this is a much smaller system than our own. And you can see one, two, three, four, five planets all crammed within the orbit of what about Venus is around our sun. But it's a smaller star. It's a, it's a much cooler star. This would be a red dwarf. And um, so the habitable zone is much closer. So these three planets really close in, they're too close, they're too hot. But E and F, those are kind of at the right distance. Um, and you can compare their size to Earth over here. They're a bit bigger than Earth. So it might work. You'd be a little bit heavier, but just grow some muscles, you'll be fine. All right. Here's Kepler 90. Um, let's see, this is, it doesn't show the habitable zone, but it does show the relative size of the planets and how far away they are from that Kepler 90 star. Here's the Earth here, and there's a few planets that are small-ish um, that could be about the same size as Earth. And then you've got some really massive, look, look at that, that outermost gas giant is even bigger than our own Jupiter. That's really cool. Uh, so we have, let's see, on the bottom here, here's our own solar system. And here's two other systems. There's Kepler-186 up here. You can see, Here's this orbit right within its habitable zone. Could be liquid water on there. And you, we can see that this planet is about the same size as Earth. That's a really, really good combination. Here's Kepler-452. And um, Kepler-452, that planet's a bit bigger than Earth, but it's within the habitable zone. You're gonna be heavier, but maybe it works. So where are we at on the total uh, tally right now of exoplanets, there are over 3,700 confirmed exoplanets. That number just keeps going up. That number could be wrong by the time I'm done talking to you today. Um, and they have planets uh, categorized in different sizes. There's mini Terran, smaller than, smaller than Terra, smaller than our own Earth. So mini Terran is about Mercury sized. Sub Terran, it's about Mars-sized planets. There's 72 of those. Terran are Earth-sized planets. Uh, Terra is, I think, the Greek word for Earth. I would like you all to correct me in the Q&A section if I'm wrong on that. I'm not 100% certain, but I know that I can count on you to fact check me. And then there's uh, 982 what they call Super Terran. Those are Super Earths. So could still live on them. or just going to be heavier. Um, 799 Neptunian-sized planets and 1,217 Jovian-sized planets, the size of our of Jupiter. So, um, yeah, the numbers just keep going up. Here are some pictures of some potentially habitable exoplanets, meaning that they are about the right size. So they're not too light, they're not too heavy. The gravity is gonna be comfortable for us and they are at the, at the right distance from their own star that there could be liquid water 
on the surface. Those are those two categories. Again, we're just looking for what we know works for us, even though there could be other life out there that we're not familiar with yet. And here is, it's also showing how far each of these planets are from our own solar system. Um, so here's Earth up here for comparison size. You know, Tau Ceti E is, that's pretty big, man. Um, Gravity is going to be kind of uncomfortable there. But hey, uh, something's better than nothing. Uh, oh, Ethan asks, is there a size bigger, there, bigger than Jovian? Yeah, I, I, um, I've heard the term super Jupiter or super Jovian, uh, bigger than Jupiter. Um, Alette asked, are there any planets the size of our sun? No, at that point, in order to be the size of our sun, there's so much mass, so much stuff around that thing that it would no longer be a planet. It would definitely be a star. You just can't get that much stuff together without creating the kind of reactions at the center of the star that make it hot and bright. The closest exoplanet to us that we know of, and there's probably not one any closer, is Proxima Centauri b. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to our own, other than our own. It is 4.2 light years away. Moving at the speed of light, it takes 4.2 years to get there. That seems like a long way away. It seems like a big distance, and it is, but not, um, in terms of the scale of the universe, that's really close. That's right next door. We can walk over there and ask them for a cup of sugar. They're our neighbor. So just a mere 4.2 light years away, there's Proxima Centauri b. Uh, we happen to have an Earth-sized planet orbiting the very star that is closest to us. There's a bunch of other ones. You know, there's some really Earth-sized planets here, 12 light years away. Here's one that looks pretty, 22 light years away. Here's TRAPPIST-1 that we were talking about. TRAPPIST-1F um, is, so the TRAPPIST-1 system is 41 light years away. Still relatively close. We're just not gonna be flying there anytime soon. Here is a great GIF showing um, a collection of exoplanet systems that we know of right now. Here's our own solar system over here in this corner for comparison. And you can see Mercury moving on the innermost orbit there. You can see Earth orbiting out here. <clears throat> and you can see all these other exoplanet systems. Most exoplanet systems that we know of are around red dwarf stars. They're very stable stars. They're very predictable. They're very easy to observe. Uh, they don't change a lot. They, they're very calm cool collected stars. They're not wild, right? Um, and because they're very small, planets are orbiting much closer to them and they can orbit really fast. Look at some of these, like, uh, look at this one here. It's moving so quick, it's like <laughs> The orbits of many of these planets are just days, just days. Like over here, all these planets orbiting this star here, they have years that last for two Earth days or three Earth days, uh, sometimes less. It's really the, the variety of planets and systems, star systems out there in this galaxy are incredible. Uh, so there have been a number of um, missions uh, studying exoplanets. Here on Earth, we have the, we have different observatories. Here's in different ground-based telescope systems. Up in space, Hubble has been looking, launched in 1990 and it's still up there. The Spitzer telescope went from 2003 until just this year. Kepler only lasted nine years, but it discovered the vast majority of planets that we're aware of. Um, TESS launched two years ago and it's going for hopefully many, many years. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be like the next Hubble. It's gonna be 10 times more powerful than the Hubble Telescope. And they hope to launch that next year. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all these, but there's a lot of satellites up there. We're looking, we're finding a lot. 
we're learning about what else to look for. All right, so I promised that I would wrap up about 11.45. I got pretty close to that, and that I would have bonus material after I covered this uh, main set of slides here. We're gonna talk about that now. If you have to go, don't worry about it. I'm not gonna be mad. Uh, you plan to be here till 11.45, you got stuff to do, please go do it. If you miss this next bit, it'll all be on the recording that goes on YouTube in a day or two. All right. We are going to talk about the Drake equation. There we go. That's the Drake equation. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about this. I'm going to teach you what this is. Um, there was this guy named Frank Drake, and he came up with this equation to estimate how many detectable extraterrestrial civilizations might exist in our galaxy. Okay, so let's break that down. He's not just looking for planets. He's trying to calculate, count on his fingers, <laughs> how many civilizations out there, how many alien civilizations might exist in our galaxy that are, we are capable of communicating with and vice versa. They can communicate to us, we can communicate to them. So he started doing the math on this and just kind of figuring out, well, let's take our best guess. So N equals all this stuff. When you're doing an equation, um, N stands for number. It's the number that you're looking for. We are looking for N. The number that we want to know is how many, the number of civilizations in our galaxy with which communication is possible. So how do you figure out N? Well, you take the heat. This is his way of figuring it out. This isn't the only way. It's just a pretty good start. So R stands for the average rate of star formation per year in our galaxy. So that's R star, rate of star formation. Cool. FP, the fraction of those stars with planets. NE, the number of those planets that may develop an ecosystem, that may develop life, okay? Oh, sorry, ecosystem, not life, but ecosystem, this like collection of materials and resources that is self-contained. Um, FL, the fraction of those planets that succeed in developing life. FI, the fraction of those planets with life that develop intelligent life. So we're not just talking about squirrels and raccoons, we're talking about intelligent squirrels and raccoons. <laughs> we're not talking about the raccoon that eats your trash, we're talking about Rocket from Guardians of the Galaxy or something like that or humans, right? FC, the fraction of those planets with intelligent life that develop interstellar communication. And L, the average length of time that such civilizations survive and continue to send communications. Okay, the longer we look at this, the, the more it makes sense. It's kind of complicated, but hey, that's space. <clears throat> You're in the right class. So. We're gonna take each of these things and you're, we're gonna take the rate of average star formation per year in our galaxy, multiply it by the fraction of those stars with planets, multiply that by the average number of those planets that may develop an ecosystem. Each one of these things, you multiply it as you continue on and the number grows or shrinks or shifts or changes depending on that, right? So what does this even look like, right? Let's take an example here. I found this handy um, calculator online that I took some screenshots of. Um, so we plug in some numbers here, right? And we're gonna get some calculations. The first numbers we're looking at are the original numbers that Frank Drake thought is like, eh, they seem like good guesses, right? The beautiful thing about this is he's not saying there are this many alien civilizations in our galaxy. He's saying, I have no idea if there are, but if we estimate that these numbers are correct, then here's an estimate where I'm, you know, educated guess. All right. I think we're gonna go until about noon. I, I think I've got about, you know, five to eight minutes of material here. So stick around. 
So let's say the number of new stars born per year in our galaxy is 10. And we're going to multiply that. Uh, here's the percentage of stars with planets, 50%. So let's say half of those stars have planets. This is what Frank Drake was guessing. Let's say that the average number of habitable planets per solar system is two, which doesn't seem all that wrong based on what we were looking at in, you know, over the last 20 minutes. Let's say that there's a 100% chance that a habitable planet develops life. Let's say that every time a planet exists with, uh, at the right distance from its planet to have liquid water, life develops. Let's say then that there is a 1% chance that life develops intelligence. So for every 100 Earths, you would get a, an intelligent species like humans. And let's say that 1% of those have a chance uh, that that life develops the ability to communicate across space like we have. And let's say that that civilization lasts for 10,000 years. All right. And then the, the, there's one other um, element here. The number of times that civilization could redevelop. Let's say life develops. We develop intelligent life. We have humans. Let's say human life goes extinct. It's really sad, but could happen. So let's say that happens. You know, we all nuke each other into oblivion, which would be so dumb. Or, you know, some big asteroid comes and takes it out like the dinosaurs, which would also be dumb. Um, there's nothing that says that intelligent life couldn't develop again. What if there was intelligent life? What if the dinosaurs were intelligent? They just didn't, you know, leave any notes for us. So this is an added thing. The number of times that a civilization could redevelop. So you plug that in here, you multiply those all together. And from his estimation, from those original estimations from Frank Drake, he figured out that there would be about 10 communicating civilizations in our galaxy at any given time. We're one of them. Now, now we're one of them just recently, or, or just in the last few decades. Um, but in our galaxy, there would be about 10. What would that mean about our universe? There, there would be 1,500 billion civilizations capable of communicating outside their own star system because the universe is huge. There's hundreds of millions of galaxies out there. So there's a lot of chances for this. All right, so let's change these numbers around, right? This is an equation. You can change numbers and see what new results you get. So we're gonna go with today's optimistic values. These are the numbers plugged in here that if you take a really optimistic astronomer, they're like, you know what? Best case scenario. Best, best case scenario. This is what we're looking at, right? Um, so we actually know that the average rate of star formation in our galaxy is seven new stars per year. So we'll correct that. Uh, we now know that, hey, at least 90% of those stars have planets. So we're going to go with 90% there. Uh, because of all the stuff that we've been looking at with exoplanets and star systems and stuff like this, we know that, um, you know, there's about 30% 30 30 of those star systems that we know of have habitable planets, have planets at the right distance, not too hot, not too cold, like Goldilocks zone, right? So we're going to take 0.3, the average number of habitable planets in the solar system. Let's say, let's be really optimistic and say there's a 10% chance that uh, a habitable planet develops life. So for every 10 Earths, one of those will develop life. Great, good, we have fish. Let's say there's a 1% chance that that life develops intelligence and another 1% chance that that life can communicate across space. Let's be really kind and say that this civilization lasts for 10 million years. And let's also be kind and assume that even if that civilization is wiped out uh, because they got hit by a meteor or because, you know, uh, the Wi-Fi stopped working and they just didn't want to go on, let's say that civilization could redevelop on that habitable planet three times. What do those numbers look like? That would mean that there are 756 civilizations in our galaxy that are capable of communicating with other civilizations. And in the universe as a whole, there would be, uh, let's see, I think we're the 
billions, trillions, quadrillions, 113 quadrillion <laughs> communicating civilizations at any given point in time. This is starting to feel more like Star Wars at this point, you know, 756 different civilizations in our galaxy, 756 different races of aliens, including us that are capable of communicating with each other. That feels like Star Wars. It feels like Star Trek kind of, I, I like that. But that's very optimistic. That's like, let's really just kind of get our hopes up and make up some numbers that support that. Now, let's get really pessimistic. Let's get really like, you know, it's probably not a good chance of it. The lowest possible numbers that you could plug into this calculation. Um, so let's just be like, you know what? There's not a lot of new stars coming. Let's say three stars per year born in our galaxy. Let's say that a low percentage of those planet, of the stars have planets, like only 22%. And let's say that only 0.01, there's only a 1% chance of those uh, stars having habitable planets. And there's only a 0.01% chance that habitable, that a habitable planet develops life. And another 0.01% that that life becomes intelligent in any way. And only a 1% chance that that intelligent life would figure out how to communicate across space. Let's say that the civilization is not very smart. It's not very um, um, self-preserving and it only lasts for 420 years before it wipes itself out through civil war and nuclear war and losing its Wi-Fi password. And let's say that it is not possible for life to form again on that planet. You got one shot and you ruined it because you lost the Wi-Fi password. Well, that's pretty pessimistic. Let's see. Yeah, zero civilizations communicating in our own galaxy is what that would lead to. But the universe is a big place. It's huge. So let's um, just expand that from our galaxy to the whole universe. Even with that really pessimistic, we're all going to die and you know the fish won't develop intelligence. Nothing's going to work. <laughs> Even with that, for that rough calculation, there would be 42 civilizations existing in the universe at any given moment in time capable of communicating outside of their own civilization. So um, I wanted to look at a few different angles of those numbers, a few different possibilities. We are going to wrap up here in just a minute. It's noon now. But all this, I mean, like even the worst possible scenario means there's 42 civilizations out there right now that are communicating. Um, so this leads to something called the Fermi paradox. Don't worry, we're gonna learn what that means. I really hope y'all are with, still with me. Let's see, oh good, there's still a bunch of you in here. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Um, and you know, I just thought that today was a good day to like, let's go off the deep end. Let's just jump in deep, let's get, complicated. Let's have some fun, right? Um, so Fermi comes from a dude named Enrico Fermi. He was an Italian physicist. Uh, he lived for not very long, only 53 years. He died in 1954. Um, he was actually the first guy to develop a nuclear reactor. Yeah, cool guy. And a paradox is a self-contradictory statement that at first seems true. So a paradox is like, you know, I'm really good at math and um, there we go. I'm really good at math at all five times that I've done math, I've gotten it right. Well, that's a paradox. I said five, I held up four. There's a contradiction there. It proves itself wrong or something seems wrong with it, right? So Fermi's paradox. If the Drake equation is correct, and there's supposed to be abundant life in the universe, where is everyone? That's the paradox, that's the paradox, right? You go, let's go back to Drake, Frank Drake and his, uh, his original calculation that there should be 10 civilizations in our galaxy communicating right now. If you get really optimistic, there should be hundreds of them, hundreds, right? Where is everyone? 
We've been looking for years. We haven't seen any evidence of any extraterrestrial life anywhere, not even in our own solar system. That's the paradox. Where is everyone? That's the question that Enrico Fermi asked and we still haven't answered that question. That question's up to you. The next generation of scientists and stuff like that are gonna have to figure that out. Um, could it be that <laughs> Shanna's asking, are you out of slides yet? <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, I'm out of slides. This is the last slide. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Uh, Shanna says, there's no end to space. And I guess there's no end to my slides either. My sl slideshows are like the universe. They just, they're, they're infinite. So I'm gonna rewind really quick here and we're just gonna leave this up here for the last minute that we're talking. Uh, when I put, when I showed this 15 minutes ago, a lot of you were probably like, wow, that's really complicated. I have no idea what I'm looking at. And now we've kind of broken that down a little bit. And we're just using symbols to try to figure out what is going on out there. So Frank Drake could be completely wrong. This equation could be wrong in a hundred different ways. It could be a totally bad way of looking at things, but science is a process of trying something and seeing if it works. And if it does, improve it and try it again. If it doesn't, change it, try it again. You can come up with your own equation for calculating how much life there should be in the universe. You can come up with your own equation for how many planets, how many habitable, exoplanets can we expect to find in our own Milky Way galaxy? Um, that's totally fine, that's the beauty of math, right? All this is made up. And the only reason we're still talking about Drake's equation is because, yeah, seems like a good idea. No one's proven them wrong yet. The biggest argument against the Drake equation is the Fermi paradox. Hey, where is everyone? Well, I'm glad that you are all here with me. We know that there's intelligent life on this planet and that you tuned into this online class through Zoom and became, through this in the last hour, this life became even more intelligent. And um, yes, Shanna, I'm out of slides. Uh, I'm gonna sign off here so I can head to lunch and I hope you all do too. I'm back next week. We're talking about more space science. I hope to see you all then. Before I sign up, before I sign off, uh, I'm gonna suit up here with my helmet. There we go. My uh, NASA logos are falling off. I'll have to tape those back on again. If you have questions, comments, if there's another topic that you'd like us to cover, you can email onlinelearning at delphian.org. Thank you so much for joining. See you next time. It's fogging up. My breath is fogging it up and I can't see the buttons. Okay, there's mute. <laughs> Bye everyone.